Hello everyone and welcome back to another review of Star Wars The Clone Wars Season 7. Today, Season 7, Episode 2, A Distant Echo. So, last time I kind of more talked about, you know, Clone Wars in general compared to the actual episode, but that's going to be different today. Today I'm actually going to mainly be talking about just the episode itself because I kind of got a lot of my big thoughts about Clone Wars over with in the last video. So, A Distant Echo, the second season and this, no, it's the second episode in the seventh season. Blah. This one, uh, kind of like the last episode, had a big change right at the beginning. So this episode is, I, I don't want to call it famous, I don't want to call it infamous, but you know a lot of people know this episode for the one that has a uh, partly risque joke in it, so to speak, where um, Anakin... And Rex are about to get on the Bad Batch's shuttle, and there's this, you know, there's this nose art of Padme on it, and you know, Anakin is very much that nose art is not staying there, you know. So you know, in in the Clone Wars, we see a lot of different Republic ships that end up having nose art painted on them. One of my favorites is the uh, is the Clone Trooper hand uh, with the battle droid net with the battle droid head, and it's in its grasp that one's that one's good uh plows bros that's that's another fun one um of course you have the more famous ones like uh like uh the uh lucky leku and the and the kawakian and and the crumb bomber excuse me crumb bomber that's that's what it was uh so you know those are the more famous ones but so you, you have this tradition continued of clones painting their painting their ships with different nose art and the Bad Batch happened to have you know a nose art of Senator Amidala on there and yeah there's it's a, yeah there, there's a couple times throughout this kids show quote unquote where you see um, different you know kind of these different stylized posters hung up where it's you know where it's Twi'lex or I think there's one with a Naboo handmaiden or something in the back of Hidden Enemy or something um and you know they're not necessarily it's like oh that's a little more adult themed and so and you know this, so this nose art is continuing in that tradition and you know Anakin's very you know Rex is very actually embarrassed you know he kind of covers his mouth with his hand and he's like ooh okay this is awkward and then Anakin just grumpily says that is not staying there that's gone that's not in this final version of this episode and rightly so, I think. Because, honestly, I'm not sure if this episode had been finished and aired in, like, 2013, 2014, when it was originally intended to, and not, you know, finished years and years later when it got revived. Um, I'm not sure that joke would have made it to final air anyway. And even if it made the final cut of the episode, I feel like that's something that um, Cartoon Network would have cut, Maybe. Um, I think it. I think they definitely. If they didn't make the conscious deci decision to cut it, then uh, the Disney probably told them to. I, I feel like though they made the conscious decision to cut it because it is replaced with another scene involving Padme. This time though, we actually see her. So everyone that's watched the trailer, and of course, you know, it goes without saying. Full spoilers here. Uh, you know, you know, in the in this is the trailer shot. This is the trailer shot where Anakin and Padme kind of interlock their fingers via the holograms so you know they're not so they're sort of kind of holding holding hands across parsecs um so the you know so that scene is in is in this episode and i really really like this scene the scene that they added last episode i thought oh okay well, this is just giving this is just putting forth the exact same information just in a different way i was more indifferent to the to the scene being changed this one i really like a whole lot better because I mean, so of course it's a common complaint that due to George Lucas not being able to write love dialogue that the relationship between Anakin and Padme in the prequels did not feel that natural and then the and then the kind of flat directing that the you know the, the, that didn't help much either so Anakin and Padme don't really feel like a couple in those in episode two and episode three, even though you know they're supposed to be. Clone Wars really goes to great lengths to rectify this, whether it was intentional because Lucas recognized his mistake, 
or it was unintentional just going, hey, this is a couple. They should act like a couple. And so then they act like a couple. Uh, you know, there's several moments out of the series where they, where you really see that great relationship between them. And that's the, and I think that's one of the reasons it is a great relationship because the Clone Wars fleshes it out so much. Of course, we can go into the nitty gritty of it's like, yeah, this was doomed from the start for a myriad of reasons. But so it's actually, it's very tragic. Was it really a great relationship? You, you guys understand what I'm saying. So this scene is is a really great addition to you know all this all these different scenes that the Clone Wars has done with Anakin and, and Padme. This one more than because the last season, season six, there was actually like a whole arc about their relationship almost, where Padme was like, I don't know, maybe marrying you, you was a mistake. Maybe we need to take a break um, within the banking clan arc. And then here, so I guess you're watching the show. I guess this would be like the next time you see Padme after that arc, now that I'm thinking about it. That sounds right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this, it feels like that after that, their relationship is even more, is strengthened even more by that, which makes sense. And now, I mean, gosh, this, this really, I don't know. I always, I always bought that they were a couple in the past, but this time, I don't know what it is. There's just, uh, yeah, these people are married. They're, you know, they're, you know, they're in this. They're married to each other, and they're, and they're a couple, and they're totally acting like it. I, it just really, and, and on top of really selling that chemistry, it's also a great moment where Anakin realizes, you know, the effect he has on his men because Anakin's kind of worried about Rex, and he's like, hey, he's being kind of. He's been kind of rash. He, Rex isn't usually this rash. You know, so I, I don't know. And then Padme says, well, hold on. Think about this, Annie. Whenever you go leaping into danger without a second thought, where's Rex? He's like, eh, usually right beside me. So it's like, mm, gee, I wonder where he, he's getting this kind of rashness from, you know, when someone he cares about is in danger. You know, he wants to he wants to run off without that much of a plan and just take action immediately. That seems kind of familiar, doesn't it, Master Skywalker? So, yeah, it's... And that Anakin having that realization that okay, I need to be there for my friend, and then that's something else. Like Anakin, Anakin sees you know, of course he, he you know, there's time later in this episode where he says I need, I want to talk to my captain alone. Yeah, technically he's Rex's superior, but I feel like throughout this war, Anakin really does see Rex as a friend, and we know Rex sees Anakin as a friend thanks to that one uh, Age of Republic comic that came out. Um, I think it was last year, maybe in the year before that, though, where where um, Rex and Jar Jar are on. I can't remember the planet. I want to say it was maybe even Jabin. You know, it's like they were using the canon version of Jabin, but I, uh, maybe not. I can't remember exactly what the planet was. But you know, Jar Jar says it's like, oh, who said that to you? And Rex says a friend, and it's like it was Anakin that said that to him. So, so it's it's really interesting to see the friendship between these two, and then. Speaking of relationships between characters, Obi Wan coming in very briefly, and you know Obi Wan's role in this episode being changed completely, because last in the original version in the story reel, um, Obi Wan came in and basically said it's like, well, the Jedi Council think this plan is foolhardy and you shouldn't go through with it, and I'm telling you you should go through with it, but I know you're going to go through with it, so you know have fun. Essentially, that's essentially what Obi Wan's role in that episode is. In this one, um, he's kind of he, he he knows we. This is really I mean we know that it's it, because of Revenge of the Sith. We know at some point he figures out that there's something going on between Anakin and Padme. How much he legitimately knows, I think, is up in the air at this point. We may get more further confirmation later on in the se- in the season in this in this last season. Uh, who knows? We may see a little bit of that in the Siege of Mandalore arc. Um, but we know that to a degree he knows about Anakin and Padme and way to keep it a secret there Obi-Wan Mace Windu's running around somewhere at this fort maybe and, and you, just, you just blurt right out you know, when Anakin's sneaking around and stuff you just blurt right out well did you at least tell Padme I said hello it's like Okay, well, gee, just shout, just shout it to the heavens, why don't you, Master Kenobi? It's like, okay, gee, thanks. <laughs> that actually got a laugh out of me. And then you could tell Anakin did not appreciate 
appreciate that comment. It's interesting. I, I've watched this episode twice now. The first time I watched it on my phone because I woke up and I didn't want to bother getting out of bed to turn on the TV. I know I'm lazy. So I just grabbed my headphones and I grabbed my phone and I watched it for like the moment I woke up. Then I watched it again uh, on my laptop a little bit later. See, you know, Seeing things on the laptop versus the phone, there's a big difference because, one, the screen is so much larger. So you can see... A lot of different, you know, a lot of different details that you missed when it's on the phone. You, I, I got the basic gist of everything that happened on, on the you know, on the phone, but there was more details I could notice on the computer. So, uh, so the, you know, there's there's this, the first time I watched it, I thought Anakin kind of gave Obi Wan a smirk, but no, he doesn't. When I watched it on the laptop and everything much more, was much more clear and I was, well, awake. Because, let's face it, I also wasn't very w- awake when I watched it the first time today. Uh, the day I'm recording this, not the day I'm uploading. He, he doesn't give Obi-Wan a smirk. Anakin gives Obi-Wan this kind of cross look. You know, this kind of... I, I don't know, but it was, it was not a friendly look. It was you shooting daggers at him for sure. And... Uh, the series has also done such a great job showing the relationship between Anakin and Obi Wan, but you know this, this that's very much a Mustafar Anakin look that he just gave Obi Wan there from Episode Three. So it's yeah, I think we're definitely going to get some moments of comradeship between them again by the time the series ends. I think you know there's there's going to be some stuff during the Siege of Mandalore because uh, again we don't know how long Obi Wan and Anakin are involved in the Siege of Mandalore. So you know they might they they might um, get a good amount of screen time. We could still see some of that comradeship because again you know we know that they get called to go save the chancellor instead of joining Ahsoka for the for the main siege of the city. I'm assuming you know, I'm assuming um, and also basically part of what we've been told. So I, I I don't know it'll be interesting to see how they how the show deals with their relationship for the rest of the series and then leading that into episode three and then we know how that ends there so yeah so i mean this the first so the first part of this episode is really wildly different from the story over real and then it becomes almost beat for beat again um and, you know then you know like i said last time this is the episode where in the story reel you had temporary jungle planet written on written on um written on the planet as the ship is coming in for a landing. That's gone, the, you know, in the finished version, that's gone. <laughs> to be expected. But it's like, it was kind of a, hey, it's gone. So basically, everything was pretty much the same from here on out. I think there were a couple scenes moved around. I th- like Wat Tambor's entrance. I'm I'm pretty sure that got moved. That scene got moved later when, when we see him. And oh my gosh. Did Watt Tambor get a makeover or what? He looks amazing now. Yeah, we've seen him like a handful of times throughout the show. We saw him in season one, specifically the Ryloth arc. And then we saw him like in a hologram or security feed stuff in uh, in season five because he was still in Republic prison at that point. And then I guess he got his corporate neutrality, neutrality and was released and uh, man, man, did he get a makeover from season one to now? Um, this, th- I spoke about this last episode about all the separatists kind of getting makeovers, finally. And so it seems like that any character model that they had for the separatists is getting got you know got a redo. And and man, does it make a difference? I mean, I it almost. Pff- I mean, it's it's hard. It's kind of weird to say this because you know you go you look at some of these episodes from two thousand eight, two thousand nine. And and compare it to an episode from 2020. Yeah, no, th- those episodes don't hold a candle. But also, you know, the episode was made. You know, you have to also think. You know, th- that's when those episodes aired. So they were probably you know finished in like 2007. So you know, they're even older than we think. So, so it. it I don't want to say that it almost makes those episodes look bad. But it's sort of, in terms of the visual style, it almost sort of kind of makes those episodes look bad. But that's only when you directly compare them. When you watch, like, I recently went back and I watched the Ryloth arc because I've just been, I've been jumping all over the place watching, oh, I want to watch this arc now. I want to watch this arc now. I want to watch this arc now because I want to watch more Clone Wars in during the week when there's not a new episode, but there's not a new episode, so I have to find something to do, something to do and to satiate my Clone Wars need. Um, 
So, yeah, I, re- I recently went back and watched the Ryloth arc. And, you know, just by itself, when you're not comparing it to anything, I think it still looks great. I think a lot of Season 1 does hold up. There is some stuff that doesn't. But overall, I think Season 1 really still holds up in a lot of ways. You can tell that they were trying to get their footing in a couple places, you know, trying to find how to do things. But overall, I think Season 1 still holds up really well. Um, so, yeah, Wat Tambor, he looks he looks great. He looks much closer to his Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith counterpart, although you don't get really too many close-ups with him in Revenge of the Sith. Basically, there's a couple group shots and then him hiding behind the table and Anakin turns to the corner and he's got the the evil Sith eyes. So, yeah, Wat Tambor looks great. I mean, there's I mean, there's not even in just the suit that he's wearing, but also in like the that you can tell that there's a mouth moving underneath the uh, or beneath the mouthpiece because you can see the cheeks moving up and down and the and the skin moving which you could never see in back in season 1 is basically just his head would move and he would point and you know, so you would, you were able to tell that he was talking but there was but there wasn't really any now that you can actually see like the skin moving and it was like oh it's and then the eyes blinking behind the glasses because that was a problem in season 1 is that sometimes the eyes would be completely obscured by reflections or something in the kind of goggles he wears but you can fully see the eyes this time around and it's just it's gorgeous this show is so gorgeous you know there's a sandstorm in this episode i'm I'm just going to start jumping around at this point there's a sandstorm in this episode and man it looks so good i I think clone wars has done sandstorms a couple times um but i don't think they've ever done a sandstorm or it's not really even a sandstorm it's just it's just some sort of storm thing you know where the vision is clouded, so I mean, it it looks really great. Um, yeah, so the Poltec, the natives of of Skako Minor, I really love their voice. That was something I wasn't sure if they would be changing from the from the original story reels to now. I didn't know if that was temp or what, but I, re- I really like I really really like their voices. It definitely sounds very alien, which is something Star Wars does great a lot of the time is making sure the aliens sound alien. Yeah, you know, these are bipedal creatures similar to humans, but you could tell that because of the conditions they're living in the planet that they're on, they've evolved differently from humans. So, it seems so you know, they they don't sound human. They very much it's, you know, their vocal cords are probably constructed different to humans, so they have this very alien sound that's completely different from human. And you know, I'm even amazed that Tech was able to translate. So because you know that with a language like that, you'd almost think that there would be a lot of sounds that they would be able to make with the vocal cords that you wouldn't necessarily be able to translate if you're a different species. So. Uh, the, the, and the, you know it may be you know that may have been one too many hurdles for the characters to have to over overcome so yeah so they didn't bother really thinking about that when crafting this new alien language <laughs> so yeah, tech can translate it fine it'll be, it'll be fine we don't need to worry about that that's one too many problems to deal with um, I find it interesting that they keep adding tiny little lines here and there for some of the bad batch in these scenes that are almost exactly the same. Um, Wrecker is getting the most so far, uh, maybe because he's he's ripe for one-liners, um, such as in the last episode when he grabs Cody out of the gunship, or rather he gets the gunship out of Cody. Uh, you know, he's, he gra- he puts Cody over his shoulder and he starts walking around and he, he just goes, boom, and then the gunship blows up. In the, in the story reels, that was just silent. Uh, and, th- and then in this episode, there's a great moment where Rex has finally had enough of crosshair. Um, and of course, some of the dialogue has been changed to fit the new context of of the right of the story because it's, it's very slightly different. And so, crosshairs being very, you know, not not you know, not being very nice, you know that that's changed very slightly the stuff of what he says. But you know, so in the story, in the original story, real record just kind of picks up Rex when Rex goes to attack Crosshair and then just puts him down. Where here, you know, he says, why don't you pick on someone not your size? Which is a cliche dodge. <laughs> because, you know, usually it's, why don't you pick up uh, pick on someone your own size? Because every, you know, it's like, that's that doesn't just get used to movie or TV. People use that just in everyday life, probably. That's how much of a cliche it is. So for him to change that slightly, I, I like that. I like that. Um, 
And then, of course, I, this joke was really funny. When, when you know, Hunter says to uh, says for Crosshair to check out the lift after Tech slices in, then he runs in and he goes, yep, it's a lift. And then Tech is like, well, we knew that. <laughs> That's funny. I find that funny. There's just a couple small little deep things that they add in that, that adds to the overall enjoyment of the episode, and I find it funny. So... Yeah, so the episode, for the most part, plays exactly the same as the story reels, besides the uh, the changes that I've mentioned. And I think the biggest change is not actually a change at all. It's just the way the episode is presented now because it's in finished animation. And you know, so when I watch this this the story reel and Echo pops out of that stasis chamber, I'm like, man. I'm sure this would be horrifying in finished animation. Here, it's just kind of sad. It's like, oh no, poor Echo. But you know, but you can't get you get what they're going for, but you don't get the full effect because it's it's not finished. But here, Echo pops out of that stasis chamber. I was disturbed. It's like, oh poor guy. I mean, it, I mean, I knew what was going to happen. I was expecting it, but there's this there's this like this light sheen of ice crystals on him from the stasis chamber still when Rex pulls him out of there. And then you know you can see this detail in the story reels of his eyes darting around because he's not really seeing what's in front of him. He's seeing all this data moving around because his mind has been hijacked. But you know again you don't get the full effect because it's unfinished animation in this finished version. Again, it's really disturbing because it's even more subtle. You see the eyes moving, but you don't. But it, at the same time, they're not moving as rapidly as fast. And it's to- And then he's mumbling. It's like we have to escape the citadel. I'll go first. It's like, oh my gosh. And then and the lighting with the uh, the lighting kind of comes from below him. He's sort of backlit while also being lit from underneath at the same time. It's it's very disturbing. It. Yeah, the the effect was sold very very well, and uh, I can't. This show the show's back. Ah, uh, and it's more gorgeous than it's ever been. Ah, uh, and this is something where I really hope that they use some of the techniques they learned with this because I feel like Filoni said, okay, we got twelve episodes. These episodes that we're gonna do, this is gonna be the last thing we ever do in Clone Wars. We're going to go all out. There were, you know, we're, even in shots that maybe don't need it, we're gonna we're gonna go the extra mile on on some of these shots, and because of that, we're gonna we're gonna miss a couple small things here and there. Like, uh, so when so when Rex and the Bad Batch are sliding down the hill into the Poltec village, if you if you look closely, Rex has one of those night vision scopes attached to his helmet, which he didn't have in the previous shot, and then and then when you know, when they get down into the village, he doesn't have them on again. So he just he just randomly acquires a set of night night vision binoculars puts him on his helmet and then removes him again by the time he gets down the hill <laughs> so i uh, so i kind of think it's like hmm maybe you just spent less time doing some fancy stuff for shots that maybe didn't necessarily need it maybe this wouldn't happen i wonder how that passed through all the different levels of editing where i don't know maybe maybe they left it in there to see hmm let's see how close attention people are paying to this i don't know but they there's so much care and detail put into shots that, like I said, don't necessarily need it, but it really amplifies it that I hope they learn. They take some of these techniques they learned on this last season of Clone Wars and use it for whatever new show that they end up doing after Clone Wars. You know, hopefully Rebels sequel. Like, yeah, at the very beginning, Rex and Anakin kind of have their little back and forth about about and it's like oh there's that thing we need to do whoa what thing sir it's like you know that thing it's like oh we don't have time for that sir it's like yes rex we do have time for that thing and hunter says okay i'll let you guys sort out whatever it is you need to sort out i'll be on the ship with the others for when you're ready to go that shot where hunter turns to say that to them the background is in soft focus putting hunter in the foreground and it's and it's like, this is a film technique you'd use usually in live action. You see it occasionally in animation, but usually when you see it in animation, it's done in feature film stuff. You know, you know, like Pixar movies and and DreamWorks or the, you know your regular Disney stuff. You, and and it, and even then, you know, you usually see it in that type of stuff. You don't usually see it in cheaper film. You know, quote unquote cheaper films like you know Despicable Me and, uh, and other Illumination stuff. They usually don't do that because it takes so much time. So to see it in what is essentially a cartoon, you know, it you know, it was a cartoon network show. It's crazy. It's so crazy to see did you, did you just render that in soft focus? Did you render the background in soft focus, guys? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So it's just gorgeous. This show is so gorgeous. I love it. Every frame is like a painting. 
Yeah, it's it's so great. They, uh, this episode especially, I'm going to have a hard time choosing what the thumbnail is going to be. <laughs> Last episode, it was easy. This time, it's like, oh, well, here's this cool shot. Here's this cool shot. Here's this cool shot. And another great one shot with the Bad Batch taking on um, the battle droids, the, the Velociraptor battle droids in the corridor outside Echo's chamber. That, you know, that's another great one shot. It's like, I can't, I can't really go back and remember too many times when Clone Wars has deliberately done one-shot action sequences, but boy, when they bring in the Bad Batch, they go all out with one-shot action sequences. It's really cool. So, yes, yeah, so the episode ends and with Echo being rescued, and then, you know, the next episode's going to pick up. It's like, okay, well, we've got him. How do we get him out of here? And all that, that entails, and I wonder how much that's going to change. Um, if any, I think next episode might have like because it, it it does start in on the action and then it ends with them escape spoilers or with them escaping. Um, I do wonder how much it's going to actually change. Um, I feel like of the three episodes or of the four episodes, the next episode might be the one that gets changed the least. But uh, we'll 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 find out. So yeah, I I thought this was a great episode. Uh, again, Bad Batch. That you know, I was wrong. Bad Batch is such a great arc to actually start with for this new season. And I can't wait for next week. So, yeah, that's pretty much going to be it for this review. Uh, I don't really have too much more to talk about. It's it's great. Again, if you're in the United States you know, and you have Disney Plus, you need to you need to go watch this show. Uh, it's it's fantastic. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hopefully, episodes will run about this long. We're running about 20 minutes shorter, give or take, you know, than last time, which makes sense because, you know, I didn't have the entire, you know, the six pre- previous seasons to talk about as well. So uh, this will probably be more of the norm. And I will see you guys next week. Thank you for watching and see you then.